Thank you, Aska. Thank you very much. Um, Assalamu alaikum, everyone. We have uh, Dr. Aska Bilal here. She's an adult and a child psychiatrist working for, at Austin State Hospital. Um, thank you, Aska. Uh, I really appreciate you kind of signing on and helping us with this. I really, I know we, we have people pour in uh, eventually, but the goal is even if we record and we can put this out, it'll be helpful. Uh, I, I think this is a really important topic. People have a lot of stigma around ADHD and I really appreciate you taking on to talk about this. I'm gonna mute myself. I'm gonna let you continue and screen share. I'm gonna be here. Um, and then at the end, we'll just, when we wrap around, people have questions. I'll ask those questions for you or I'll kind of come up with things that we can discuss and then we'll go from there. Assalamu alaikum everyone, um, brothers and sisters. My name is Dr. Aska Bilal. I'm a child uh, and adolescent psychiatrist. I work in Austin, Texas. And today I'll be talking about ADHD. So let me start sharing my presentation. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about um, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder specifically in children. Uh, before I start, I'd like to give a disclaimer uh, that today's seminar is for educational purposes only. It should not be in any way taken as medical advice. If you have specific medical questions, please consult with your physician. So ADHD, um, the reason I wanted to pick this topic is because um, it's, it's, a com it's a very common um, condition that we see in many individuals, children, as well as adults, but it's often misunderstood and there's a lot of stigma associated with it. Um, so if you look at the prevalence, um, it's present in about 5.3% of uh, kids. Um, and it's thought that the prevalence actually may be higher because there's many kids who go under, do, not, uh, do not get diagnosed uh, for different reasons. Maybe their, you know, their parents don't want them to be diagnosed because of the stigma associated, or maybe um, the, the school is not catching it. Um, so there could be different reasons. Now, 65% um, of kids um, continue to have symptoms in adulthood. It's much more common in males than females, uh, but um, females may be underdiagnosed because they do not usually present with the typical symptoms of hyperactivity. So as a result, many go missed um, and do not get the diagnosis. Um, in terms of the different factors that contribute to this condition, genetics plays a big role. Um, so twin studies show about 71 to 90% uh, variance, uh, which means that it's pretty high. The, the, the probability is pretty high if you have a family history of ADHD that you may also develop it. But we can also not discount the uh, effects of the environment on the development of this condition. So very low birth weight, prematurity, they have been associated with this condition. Um, an individual that may have had a head injury or a brain injury is also at higher risk for having symptoms associated with this condition. Um, in many cases, um, ADHD is not just present alone. It could also be present with other conditions, um, such as oppositional defiant disorder, conduct disorder, anxiety, and depression can also be pretty common. Um, so these are things that you also have to take into account when you uh, are thinking about a child who may have ADHD, that what other things may also be there and may also be affecting the child. So let's talk about um, the diagnosis. How do we diagnose ADHD? So um, as psychiatrists, we often use um, DSM-5 criteria. It's a list of um, criteria that we look for in order to diagnose this condition. Um, so as the name implies, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, the symptoms are divided into two categories. So we have the symptoms of inattention and then symptoms of hyperactivity. So um, 
with regards to inattention, the child may have difficulty paying close attention or maybe making a lot of careless mistakes, may have difficulty um, sustaining attention in tasks or play. So they're easily distracted. Um, they don't pay attention when they're spoken to directly and uh, they're often described as daydreamers. So they may be just staring in space and the teacher is going on and on and they, you know, it seems as if the kid is not listening. Um, they may have difficulty following through with instructions, with schoolwork or chores. Um, they may have difficulty organize, uh, organizing themselves and, and tasks and activities. Um, they often avoid or dislike um, tasks that require sustained mental effort, which require a lot of time uh, because they do not have the attention span to spend that much time in doing that and waiting for the results. Um, they often lose necessary things. Um, they're very forgetful. Um, they get distracted. They can, so these are the symptoms that you see with regards to inattention. When we talk about hyperactivity, a hyperactive ADHD kid is one that is always on the go. So... Uh, in school, the teacher would say that he's all the, he or she is often fidgeting with his hands or feet, is squirming in the seat, often leaves the seat in class or other settings. Um, these are kids that love to run about or climb excessively. So I would like to stress excessively because it's normal for kids to do those things, but they're just doing it all the time to the point um, that they are getting frequent injuries or they're getting in trouble. Um, these kids have difficulty playing quietly. Uh, again, they're often on the go. They act like they're driven by a motor. Um, these kids love to talk excessively and often interrupt others. So they blurt out answers before even the question is asked. Um, they have difficulty waiting for their turn. So if they're standing in the line, they have a lot of difficulty doing that. They would often interrupt or intrude on others. So in order to diagnose ADHD, um, you need to have symptoms. Uh, you can have symptoms uh, from either inattentive, uh, inattention, or you can have symptoms of hyperactivity. You don't need to have both of them, but you can have both of them. So it's so when we diagnose, we can classify it as ADHD, inattentive type, hyperactive, hyperactive type, or combined type depending on the symptoms the kid is displaying. Um, it can be diagnosed any time before the age of 12 years and the symptoms do have to be present before six months. One thing that I do want to stress is that when we are diagnosing ADHD, we have to keep in mind that are these symptoms typical for a kid of this age? So these are things that you have to keep in mind because if it's typical, then that is not ADHD. The second thing that you want to keep in mind is, is it affecting the functioning of the child? So is it causing stress at home? Is it causing stress in school? Is it affecting um, the kid's academic performance? Um, are they having difficulty making friends because they're so impulsive or, um, you know, intruding on others? Um, so, so those are the things that you want to keep in mind when, you um, giving a diagnosis of ADHD. So before I talk about how it's diagnosed, um, I do want to talk about um, how ADHD affects the brain. So, so it, the, the way it affects the brain is pretty complex. It affects different areas of the brain. And even scientists don't know the, exactly how it happens because the brain, as we know, is very complex. But if I were to just make it as simple as possible, it affects the frontal lobe of the brain, which is the area of the brain behind the forehead and towards the front of the brain. So this is the area of the brain that helps with organization, with planning, with impulse control, um, with attention. So kids that have ADHD have a, some dysfunction in this part of the brain uh, so that their um, nerve cells or neurons are having difficulty communicating with each other. 
um, there are certain um, chemicals in the brain called as neurotransmitters that help an, each nerve cell communicate with another. And um, in ADHD, uh, these nerve cells are not able to do that communication as well as they would normally uh, because they, the neurotransmitters may be present in lower amounts and the neurotransmitters typically associated with ADHD are dopamine or norepinephrine. Um, so this is just a very simplified version, but I did want to talk about how um, ADHD is affecting the brain. Um, so in terms of the evaluation, um, so if you think that your child may have ADHD or may have symptoms that are concerning, the first thing you want to do is to consult with your doctor. And typically, it's usually the pediatrician. So you want to consult with your doctor and say, these are the symptoms that I'm thinking of. Um, you want to talk to the teachers, see if they have any concerns. And then the pediatrician may um, do their own evaluation or they, depending on what they think, if there are other things involved, they may also refer to a psychiatrist. Um, and usually the way they would evaluate is to take a thorough history, asking you lots and lots of questions about the child, observing the child. And then they may also send um, some scales, um, which is a, a checklist with different questions for you to fill out um, questions about your child and, and you would have to rate. Um, so I'm just, I've just like pasted one example of a scale, it's called a Vanderbilt assessment scale, a parent version. So you would fill it out and then a similar scale would be sent to the kids' teachers or their multiple teachers, different teachers, the more the better. So they would fill it out. Once those scales are filled out, uh, the pediatrician or the psychiatrist will score them and then see if ADHD is present, if it is, how severe it is, how is it affecting the functioning. Um, at the same time, um, uh, the physician would also be looking to see if there are any other things that may be contributing to uh, the difficulty with attention or hyperactivity or impulse control. Um, is there any anxiety present? Is there, are there any depressive symptoms? Or are there any medical issues present? Say they may have a sleep disorder that could be affecting the concentration uh, in the morning. So, so that's how the diagnosis is made. Typically, we don't test for IQ. We don't uh, have to do a psychological testing um, to give this diagnosis. But if there are uh, concerns that there uh, there is some um, there, that there are IQ deficits or um, that there are learning disorders involved, psychological testing can be helpful, uh, but you don't need that to make the diagnosis. So once the diagnosis is made, the important question is how do you treat it? So in terms of the treatment, we can divide it into pharmacological treatment, meaning the medication, uh, and then the non-pharmacological treatment, other kinds of uh, treatments that do not involve the use of medication. Now, before I talk about medication, I do want to stress that in no way are the medications cure for ADHD. They're just uh, meant or they work to help manage the symptoms of ADHD. And But they are very effective. Um, I think the success rate is about 70 to 80% with medications, um, they work fast, we get the results pretty fast, we know if the medication is working or not, and there are different options. The first line of treatment in medications are the stimulant medications. Um, these are divided into two types. We have the amphetamine based and then the methylphenidate based. We may have um, heard about Adderall, Vyvanse, Ritalin, Concerta, and there are other names as well. Um, so they all um, work towards increasing the amount of those chemicals in the brain that I talked about, either more, uh, mostly dopamine, and in some cases also norepinephrine, and as a result, um, help, uh, uh, help the child's brain focus, uh, pay attention, and, and have improved impulse control. Now, uh, all these different kinds of medications, um, 
they may work similarly, but there are some differences in the way, um, in the duration for which they work. Some are short acting, some are long acting. It's also the way they are administered. So some are oral, some can be sprinkled onto food. There are also patches. So there are different types that can be used. Uh, when uh, one medication may work for one child, but may not work for another. So in many cases, it's also a trial. So your doctor may start uh, your child on one medication. It could be very helpful. It could not be helpful. So you, they may want to start and try another one. Uh, but the good thing, again, like I said, was that the onset, that usually you would know within a week or so if the medication is actually working or not. Um, stimulants are associated with side effects. Um, so, the so they can decrease the appetite. They can decrease weight. They can be... Uh, they can uh, affect the sleep. So these are things that the physician keeps in mind when giving these medications and are monitored. And if they are, if the side effects are developed, you either manage the side effects, but if you're not able to do that, then you would look at other options. The other options are non-stimulant medications. So they work a little differently. Um, so they, um, and the two categories in this are the alpha-2 agonists. Uh, you may have heard of clonidine or intunib, so they work a little differently, and statera. Um, so these medications, they're not, uh, the success rate is not as high, but they could be very helpful in a child who's not able to take the stimulants due to one or another reason. Now, while, uh, if the physician is treating the ADHD, they're also thinking about like the other conditions that may be present. So if there is anxiety or depression, they may also be treating it at the same time or they may choose to treat the anxiety first and then treat the ADHD depending on what they feel is appropriate in that situation. So, um, so that's with the medications. I'm sorry, I just skipped a few slides. So, so that's the medication part. So medication is found to be extremely effective, but at the same time, there are also non-pharmacological therapies. Typically, these are used in addition to medication rather than just being used by their own. On their own, they're not as effective in many cases. In younger kids, they may be help, helpful on their own, but if the symptoms are not being managed despite using these strategies, then you often do want to add medication on top of it. So the non-farm therapies can be divided into, um, you know, psychoeducation. So the first step, like we are doing today, is educating, getting education about ADHD. So as a parent, you want to know more about the condition and making sure that the resources where you're getting the information from um, uh, are actually accurate. So you want to talk to your doctor about it um, and you want to read about um, what this condition is, how it is treated, and what's the prognosis. And then obviously consulting with, your, with the experts. Um, there are educational sessions that you can attend. Um, then your physician may also refer you for behavioral therapy. So um, this could include therapy for the child. So if the child is older, old enough, um, they can do CBT or uh, with a more behavioral focus where the therapist is helping the child organize themselves and using incentives to um, increase the desired behavior. And then there are also therapies that focus on the parents. So helping the parents help their child. Um, and one of these uh, treatments that's pretty effective is parent management training. It's about eight to 10 sessions long and the therapist helps um, the parent develop strategies and a behavior plan to manage their child at home and at school. And for younger kids, there is a therapy called parent-child interaction, uh, interaction therapy, PCIT, which is also very effective for kids that have a lot of behavioral issues. Um, other than that, lifestyle changes may be helpful. You know, as we know, exercise, physical activity, it always helps. Um, you know, eating a healthy and balanced diet 
it's also um, uh, it, it, it's helpful, but um, you know, there's no direct association to say that a certain kind of a diet or a certain substance is going to um, help manage the symptoms. But if you know, you should always always try to give your child a well balanced diet so that they are healthy, their brain is developing in uh, a normal way. So, um, so these are the non farm treatments. Then other than that, there are things that you, as a parent, that you may learn in therapy and, you know, you may want to think about at home to help your child. So the most important thing that you do want to remember is that this is not the child's fault. The child is not engaging in these behaviors intentionally. Um, and, um, you know, this is just like any other medical condition. So if your child has asthma, or they have diabetes, you would seek treatment and you would try to help them with their symptoms. Similarly, if your child has ADHD, you want to be able to help your child. You want to be an advocate for your child and to make sure that they succeed. It is difficult because you there's a lot of stress associated with it, but you are the best person to help your child um, get the help that they need. At the same time, you also want to remember that it's not your fault. There is no way, um, the way you parent does not affect them um, developing ADHD, but there are things that you can do to help manage their behaviors and to improve the way they function on a daily basis. So the things that you can do is um, you can create more structure for them. We know that the more the structure uh, created for a child in their daily routine, the better they're going to perform. So uh, helping the child know that these are the things that need to be done at a certain time that would, autom that would help improve the way they function, giving them clear instructions, using rewards and consequences. So if they're doing something good, you want to be able to reward it and you don't and you want to reward it in real time rather than just waiting a week later that oh you did good and now I'm giving you the reward so that they get the reinforcement right at that time. And then if they're not doing something, they're not engaging in the desired behavior rather than punishing them, you may set up some consequences um, and your therapist can help guide and create a behavior plan that you can use at home. The most um, important thing that you want to do is to give a lot of positive feedback to your child. Um, so if they're doing something good, even if it's something small, you want to give them a lot of praise as much as possible because kids thrive on that. If they get that positive feedback, they're going to want to do that behavior again. Their motivation would increase and you wanna keep on doing that. Never think that it's enough. Um, and when you're praising your child, you want to be as specific as possible. So say if they clean their room rather than saying good job, you would say good job cleaning your room or you know, picking up trash or something like that so that they know what was the behavior for which they received praise. Um, other than that, you know, we talked about increasing physical activity. Nowadays, our kids, especially because of COVID, they spend a lot of more time indoors, but we want to make an effort um, to make, to see if that they spend a good amount of the day doing physical activity outside, spending time outdoors. And this is especially helpful for the hyperactive types because they have a lot of energy that they want to use. Um, making sure um, that they maintain good sleep, that's important. So they sleep at a certain time, at a good, at a good bedtime and they wake up um, at the same time every day, again, you know, creating a structure and a routine. Um, if there are sleep difficulties, you wanna discuss with your physician as well. Um, having them read books, that, that can be very helpful. Um, and then you wanna limit the screen time. 
and screens again include cell phones, TV, video games, computer. So you want to limit that as much as possible. And at the same time, you do want to spend one on one time with your child doing activities, doing things that you both enjoy. You want to increase the amount of positive interactions you have with your child because ADHD, the kids with ADHD, because of the difficulties they have can often create stressful situations at home. And um, there could be a lot of negative experiences associated with it. So you wanna, you wanna improve your communication with your child and have one-on-one -on -one time with them. Um, and then in the end, you, you know, the goal is for you to be an advocate for your child. You're the parent, you know your child the best and you're the one who can help them in the best manner possible. So while being an advocate for your child, you also want to know uh, things that the school can do to help your child. So we, uh, so many schools have psychologists who are able to test a child to see um, what kind of uh, difficulties they are having and how um, they can be helped. At the same time, there are there are a couple of things that you do want to. Um, educate you about. So there are two federal laws that um, can help kids that are having difficulties um, get uh, better access to education and help in school. The first one is called a 504 plan. So it's part of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973. And this plan ensures um, access to free and appropriate public education by providing accommodations that allow equal access to curriculum in the general education setting. So what that means is that the school is mandated to provide accommodations to the child to help them succeed. So if they are having difficulty with attention, there are certain things that the school can do for example, they can give them more time to, for testing. They can break down their work into smaller um, uh, pieces so they're able to complete their work. They're able to, you know, um, the teacher may be able to give more reminders and more corrections so the child, stay, the child stays focused. So these kind of accommodations can be provided by the school. And if you have a child who's struggling, you can ask, for that and they can develop the plan. It does not require any specific testing. It's very easy um, to do in the general education classroom. Now, if your child is having difficulty despite getting those accommodations in class, then you may wanna think about uh, what we call is IEP, Individualized Education Plan. So in other words, it's special education. So this is also, um, a federal law under the Individual with Disabilities Act. And it's your right as a parent to request the school um, saying that you think that your child may benefit from special education. So once you put that request in writing, um, then the school has typically has 90 days to test your child um, to do, psycho uh, to do um, psychological and academic testing to see what are the areas they're struggling in and then provide special services to that child um, to help them succeed and to help them learn. Um, so these are things that you may wanna read more about, get information um, and use these resources um, so that your child can do better. Um, so this is typically it with regards to the treatment. Um, I have included a list of resources that you can use. Um, uh, you know, you can read more about ADHD. Um, you can go to the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry website and you can look for resources. There are lots of handouts uh, for parents about ADHD and other conditions that you can read about. And then um, I was also able to see on Austin ISD website, there are there is information about 504 services and special education. So you can contact them and get more information. 
Um, and here are my references. And that's the end of my presentation. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Thank you, Aska. That's quite helpful. Um, I'm going to go through a couple of questions. I definitely think this uh, lack of understanding um, this with the ADHD, right? Um, because some kids are really intelligent and they have this whole compensation of pushing through things and you don't see it until they're high school. I get this in my private practice a lot is yeah. I have to, I see a lot of anxiety and I have to really ask people is, has that, um, has anybody do you have ADHD? And then the parent would say, yep, in third grade, somebody mentioned that my child may have ADHD, but we didn't pay attention. What happens is, and this is really, if you talk about racial discrimination, I've seen that is in Caucasian population, they're more aware, less stigma, and tend to get more help. And maybe this is a very anecdotal, anecdotal experience of mine, or sort of just clinically seeing that white population does better than brown or black population because they're more aware, they get help, and that's why they do well at school because they're getting help and they they tend to do better in life because they've gotten the help. So I don't know if this is really true or not, but I'm sure this could be a good research point, but definitely um, something to think about is we, because of the stigma, how we're leaving our child behind, um, the kids overcompensating, the kids working hard, uh, sometimes kids uh, tend to present in two settings, right? One setting is they do really well at school because they've done well holding it and bring it at home. ADHD in my cases can present with aggression, irritability, behavioral problems. And we don't tend to um, sort of understand that really well. There's a question here about if neurotransmitters are involved, would ADHD more likely lead to mental issues in the future, such as postpartum depression and all of that? Yeah, definitely. If um, the ADHD is untreated, you know, so um, it, untreated ADHD, we've seen um, that it's been associated with, you know, accidents, motor vehicle accidents, or it's been associated with higher divorce rates, uh, with poor work performance, poor academic performance, um, you know, as adults. So there are certain, you know, and that can affect the person psychologically and also lead to other um, disorders, maybe anxiety or depression. At the same time, you know, obviously ADHD is an organic illness. It affects your neurotransmitters. And, you know, the imbalance could also lead to other um, disorders, like you said, depression or anxiety or other kinds of mental illness. So that's why it's really important um, to be able to treat it, to be able to manage it, to prevent those worse outcomes. I think that's that's a um, ADHD. You know, I'm sorry, you're cutting off. Oh yeah, I know. For some reason, my internet's kind of playing. Can you hear me now, Aska? Yes. Okay. So yeah, no, definitely. I think the really valid points um, about ADHD. There's another question which said, what could be non-med related treatments? I know a lot, this is the other part I tell people with ADHD. ADHD meds are the most need meds along with your cardiology meds. And the greatest part of ADHD meds is you take it, it works, you take it, it doesn't work. Really like long-term side effects wise, they've been studied on 20, 30 years. Some of the oldest medications are the stimulants in some ways. Um, top side effects really sleep and appetite, right? Because if you start somebody on a stimulant, it decreases your appetite. Long -term so <laughs> average they say you lose about two inches of oh sorry am i breaking yeah you were breaking i heard the part about stimulant side effects and i couldn't hear anything after that yeah so no, i was just saying um, people are so um scared about adhd meds but there's really the most studied meds in a lot of ways yeah. um there's a question about non non-MD related treatments. I'm going to let you answer and then I may add some lines. So you're talking about the non-stimulant medications as to what kind of side effects they may have? I guess, I guess the question is non-medication related treatment other than behavioral. Could you type the question because I'm having difficulty. Mm -hmm.
Um, I'm sorry, uh, Dr. Khan, like- uh, do, you, do you see that, breaking. the question? Um, okay, let me, let me actually move my computer and see if that will help. In the chat, can you type it? Can you guys hear me now? Is... Yes, I can. I don't know why my internet's giving me hard. Is it better now? It's better, yes. Okay. So no, I think the question is, yeah, in the chat, it's what could be the non-medical related treatments? For ADHD? Yeah, I'm going to let you go and then I may have something to add. Sure. I mean, with non-medical treatments, again, it's mostly focused on therapies, you know, more organization, um, you know, therapy for yourself as a parent, you know, getting you know, to know how to manage your kid behaviorally, helping them succeed. And for the child as well, helping them um, get more organized. But, you know, research has shown that the, these treatments, non-farm treatments on their own are not as effective. Um, I'm sure you know about the MTA study, uh, which showed that, you know, either medication or combination of medication and non-farm treatments are the most effective in the treatment of this condition. Um, so that's what I believe. Uh, but I mean, you're, you're, you have a private practice and you see a lot of patients. So if there's something else you want to add, that would be wonderful. So yeah, no, no, definitely. I think um, the biggest part is buying into the illness, right? Um, for me, having everybody who has an illness not take medication would be ideal. I do not want folks to be on meds in general, but again, you really have to figure out what medication is doing for you and how can you achieve that uh, without medication, sometimes maybe 10, 20%. And there's a lot of, so I, because I've done the integrative psychiatry fellowship and I do a lot of holistic medicine, um, there's this whole new field called nutritional psychiatry that's taking over. And um, they're practicing a lot more of this outside of United States because um, I went to an international nutritional psychiatry conference and um, and I think they they were talking about omega three fatty acids. Huge study of Nordic Natural is a brand that they used in research. But omega three fatty acids, one which has more EPA than DHA, is a good way to support your brain. Um, I wasn't into medications and vitamins. I would kind of say, hey, we're eating good, healthy food. We don't need vitamins. But they really were comparing of how much of salmon you need to eat to get that omega three fatty acids. It was like four chunks of big salmon every night for dinner which is impossible. So, the, so there was this whole thing about, there's a big um, website called Food and Behavioral Research uh, done at Oxford. And they're really looking into food as a way to treat illnesses and stuff. Uh, the other thing is uh, there's a whole micronutrient supplementation that I do in my practice. Uh, it's a non-medical way of treating ADHD. It's hit and miss because it's food. There's limited evidence. Not a lot of people want to study it, but uh, it's basically high doses of multivitamins packed in a box and it's done over the counter. Um, it's done in a stepwise. So I've, I've had um, some good responses. People have kind of said, great, this works great for my child. Some not so much, and some we have had some side effects. So, but there are other things. But at the same time is, like you said, they've done MTA studies and they've looked at it and they said, what do you really are trying to achieve? Are you trying to achieve your kid to just support him because you're afraid of meds? or you really think your kid has just mild ADHD and you're trying to treat just the mild ADHD with milder versions. So you really have to know before you decide what the treatment protocol is based on what you're trying to achieve. Um, yeah, and, so yeah, it comes down to the functioning, like how is the kid functioning? Yeah, exactly. I, for me, all illnesses is all about functioning, right? How do we help these kids? What are you trying to achieve for your child? If you're going to ignore the diagnosis and pretend you're getting them some help and not doing the whole thing, we're not going to have optimal response. So I think kind of making a decision that if I'm going to treat my child, can I do good? And certainly, right, I, I see this all the time in my private practice is we start people on stimulant, don't work. Uh, it's trial and error until we get it. Sometimes the same class of other medication or stimulant works better. Yeah. And sometimes people take medication. The good part about ADHD meds is also, right? You take it, it works. You don't take it, it doesn't work. Take it on a Monday or Wednesday. Don't take it on a Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. There's a lot of room. People take it off school and things. And there's a question next to it is, is it possible for these kids to be hyper-focused on some activities like screen and games and start showing symptoms when off of them? And also, can you please comment on transition from one activity to the other with ADHD? Lack yeah. of planning and organization with adults, especially with ADD type. 
Yeah, so I mean, you know, hyperfocus is pretty common, especially uh, in activities that, uh, you know, a child may want to do. So say, for example, if they're interested in Legos, you know, um, they, they may be able to focus for a long time, but, you know, often parents say, oh, my kid is able to do that. Then why are they not able to focus in school? They must be doing that intentionally, you know? So that is pretty common with um, ADHD. So it's usually like, you know, tasks that are not that interesting for the person um, or tasks that require a lot of mental effort. So those are the ones where you see a lot of difficulties. Um, and then um, as Dr. Han was saying, um, they do have difficulty, they may have difficulty transitioning from one task to another again, because you know they're too focused on that one thing and then they have to switch gears they may feel overwhelmed and, and as a result may have um, difficulties. Yeah, and that the, I, I'm gonna come back to it, but I think the other question is what about the adults who find it similarly hard with, is that pretty noticeable, but um, transitioning from, that was a question, I think. Let me go back. The question, lack of planning and organization with adults, especially with ADD type. Yeah, it is pretty common, but um, you know, obviously adults have, may have more maturity and they may have found their ways on how to manage it, you know? So it may not be as noticeable as it could be in a child. A child would just throw a tantrum, but as an adult may try to mask it in other ways, or they may be able to help themselves, you know, by creating checklists for them or making sure that their day is organized. Um, so things like that. So they're not forgetful. They're able to transition from complete one task at, in a certain time and then be able to transition. Yeah. I mean, I, that's my experience too in uh, kids in, uh, with hyperactivity, right? They prefer, it's preferred versus non-preferred activity. Certainly if you're, and even if you start the medication, they're, they're going to do a good job at sitting in front of screens for hours and not do a great job. Uh, what it really means, some of it is behavioral component, right? How do you kind of get your kid to do um, um, what they really need to be doing at that time? And that's another kind of parenting, like the techniques that's awesome. Re uh, parenting strategies that you mentioned, they're really kind of uh, taking that and working with it is saying, okay, and reward systems. That leads me into this another question, right? People have, uh, somebody has asked that, um, sometimes parents with multiple kids find themselves focusing on an ADHD kid, which may affect the siblings. Any advice? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's, that's a very important question, and a very valid question. So just because of the, you know, the situation at home or in school that this one child with ADHD may be creating, um, and then the parents are just, you know, focused on that child, um, the other kids, may feel that they're not getting as much attention. And if that continues, it is possible that those kids may develop their own mental health issues. So they may develop anxiety or they may develop depression. And they may also learn that if they wanna get attention, they have to act out behaviorally or they have to do something that the parent doesn't like because that's the way you get attention. So as a parent, you always, and I know it's it's easier said than done, but you want to keep that in mind um, that if you have a child with ADHD and you're trying and you're investing your time and helping that child, you you want to make sure that your other kids are not feeling deprived or ignored. So again, it comes down to one on one time. So you may want to divide your day such that, you know, you have a certain, you know, mommy and me time with the other child, where you're just spending one-on-one -on -one attention with them, doing something that they like to do. So for example, going to the mall or the park or doing some preferred activity that they like to do so that they feel valued and they feel that my parent um, is spending the time with me and not just focusing on the other kid who, um, who obviously needs the help, but but the other kids who are doing well, you want to make sure that they stay that way and don't run into more problems. No, most certainly, you know, I, I tell in my practice that uh, self-esteem is like riding a cycle. If you're going to fall so often, you're going to not feel confident riding that cycle, right? So that's exactly what happens with ADHD kids in elementary school. I tend to encourage people to treat um, elementary kids 
and the middle schoolers for the ADHD versus so much, not so much in high school. Um, because the more you kind of help them support, create those, you know, it's all about creating skills, right? So if, if the kid has ADHD, it doesn't has ADHD, he's always not sitting in his chair, getting into trouble. We, I see a lot of boys in middle school become like the class clowns because they find their identity of feeling like, okay, if I be funny and I be stupid in the class and everybody's going to give me attention, that's how I'm going to. So this learn to kind of create these new skills that are not good for them. Uh, that happens at home too. Kids who have ADHD, if they're not treated, uh, they become the victim uh, in a way or the, the identified patient at the house. There's all other conflict that's going on, but because this kid acts out, uh, all the attention goes to them and the other kids do not get the attention they need or there's some other issue that's happening at home that is not paid, uh, pay, being paid. And this is why I kind of say family therapy is so important sometimes after having treated the kid because if it's creating chaos at home, that you guys are arguing or parents are shouting at each other because, hey, the kid's done something else, but now we're focusing on the kid and his mistakes because we're not talking about our relationship or not talking about things. So definitely, and the answer is, right, if your kid is that dysfunctional, let's get it treated or focus and get help. And it may be wrong. I mean, if you're you having these tantrums and you're thinking it's ADHD and you're treating a child, it doesn't have ADHD, then it could not be ADHD. It could be something else. But at least we've ruled out one thing out of that. And then in middle school, I often say this is it, right? Behaviors. If you don't treat those, then they act into these behaviors. High school, often your brain's developing. You would hope that because you treated the ADHD in elementary and middle school, they build these organization tools, to-do list, ways to kind of, and as they grow. And into adults too, I see a lot of adults, even physicians in my practice who have done so well, but because they're so intelligent and they have not taken care of the ADHD <laughs> because it was almost like, this is talking about older people, right? 10, 20 years, people didn't talk about it. Now my practice is full. Every day I get 30 calls from, because it's a college town for adult ADHD. Everybody wants to get on the stimulant. Um, but back then they really studied hard. They worked hard. They known how to kind of get there, but they've never gotten help because it was not part of the deal then. It was not something that was talked about. Now when they really have to take care of families, work, it just gets chaotic and uh, stressful. So mm -hmm. no, certainly I think kind of being aware, getting that help for ADHD, understanding if there's ADHD um, and then reaching out to kind of do other things along with it, not just hoping the medication be the answer, but all the behavioral techniques and the parenting strategies to right. get a child the help. Certainly, yeah, it's a combination. So there's a lot. Definitely, to yeah. Do you get a lot of those in your, I know you do inpatient care, what kind of ADHD kids do you get in your inpatient care there? Ones I see, they have a lot of comorbidities. And yeah, they have other things going on too. Yeah. So, but so there are sometimes people you see, you feel like, hey, they could have gotten help. You know, I mean, I, like I was telling you about my cousin, um, I feel like he really had ADHD, was a bright child, but because he did not get the help he wanted, I always saw my grandmother getting mad at him all the time <laughs> because he always did all kinds of hyperactive things. And poor boundaries because kids with ADHD sometimes do not understand personal boundaries. They push kick kids and then they get into trouble. Um, and now he's doing well in something else, but he could not finish school because he never uh, felt he could stay there and sit and study. And yeah. that's how academics get affected. And, yeah. and I think that's the we second have a lot step. Of potential, but that potential was may, have, may not have been used, you know. So, no, so the, those are things that you want to talk, think about because uh, many kids with ADHD, they're very smart, they're very intelligent, but yeah. just they have they struggle with with these things. They have difficulty using their the the inherent skills that they may have um, and doing things that they may want to do. Yeah, no, definitely. There was uh, there's another research that says one third of the ADHD kids actually, if they stayed on medication or untreated or treated, get better, as in they've learned tools, as you see adults having ADHD, but they've learned tools to manage things, to-do list, um, organization skills and stuff. James Ochiova, he's a guy in Austin. He's written a book on adult ADHD and managing skills. He, he also takes people on um, he lives in Lake Way, but he's private practice. But he's um, really talking about how to organize and treat mm -hmm. ADHD with therapy. Um, that's one third of the people. One third of people actually need medication all their life. They tend to need medication to survive with their ADHD. And one third, they say, end up having a mood disorder, either anxiety or bipolar. 
were wrongly diagnosed or anxiety and depression developed post not treating ADHD. Mm -hmm. And that is why it's so important to, and especially, and you know, with everything, 15 years of my practice in psychiatry, I've kind of seen so many changes. I've seen people uh, um, having more ADHD now. I don't know if it's the chemicals around the thing, the environmental pollution, the food, I mean, dyes, the kind of dyes they do. Although I know sugar, they've studied, it's controversial. If, is, does sugar cause hyperactivity or not? Mm -hmm. But more certainly with whole nutritional psychiatry taking on, they're talking about uh, low carb diets, just for mood disorders, healthy eating, and more plant-based diet ketogenic diets to help with your mood disorders and stuff. I don't think so there's enough research on ADHD with food and with that kind of diet, but I, I definitely think kind of eating healthy is such a big thing. Sleep yeah. again. Yeah, I mean, it helps with other medical conditions. So why would it not help, you know, with your brain? <laughs> yes, no, most certainly in sleep. I think that gets, I if I could sell sleep in packets to teenagers, I would do it. <laughs> it's just, <laughs> it's a struggle getting them because that's where I say your brain is regenerating. Uh, and some people need more sleep. Some need six hours, some need nine hours. Everybody has a different, finding out if you're not, sleep's going to be a big part of how you are. I mean, even as adults, if you don't sleep, you're cranky. Uh, and you can only imagine that crankiness in adults, in kids can present with so many behavioral problems. Sure. Yeah. Uh, I see that there are some questions. Let me see. Okay, so I'm reading that you mentioned they forget a lot. How can we help with this? That makes any memorization or asking about school very hard because they forget everything every few minutes. I had ADHD growing and highly succeeded in life, but everything was so hard. Yeah, so again, like, you know, like we were talking, so there are different strategies that can be used, you know, setting up reminders, you know, in school, if your kid is struggling with these things, the, the school may be able to make certain accommodations to help your child. Um, you know, they may get, they may not get like, um, you know, a very long assignment at a time, but may break it into small parts. So it's easier for the child to do that. Um, and then reminding them to stay on task that may make remembering easy. Um, so those are things that they can do, but say if, you know, those strategies are not working despite all the accommodations, um, then you may want to think about medication or at least trying it, you know, um, giving it a chance and seeing if that's something that could be helpful. Yeah, I know. Getting, do, treating it from so many different ways. Uh -huh. um, learning techniques. Does your kid like to uh, learn while he's listening to the TV at the background, sits on something connected, the chair that moves. People are, I mean, some schools have started implementing some of these things where they have this uh, bob chair which moves while you're sitting for kids who are hyperactive. Um, but most certainly kind of supporting the kid from every aspect, not just hoping the med's going to be the answer. Yeah, I mean, nowadays, I, I, I know that um, I came from the Northeast, so there are certain schools that, you know, focus on ADHD kids, so this class size is much smaller, um, you know, and they have these things in place in the classroom to help those kids succeed. So those are also things, you know, I know it's not possible for everybody, but things that can be thought about. Definitely, definitely kind of just reaching out to school and seeing where your kid is. Where is he struggling? Is it just math? Is it everything? Is it more in the afternoons? And that's why we give this med tracking log sheets to my patients, sort of asking them to say, um, just fill out and see when your kid struggles. Just don't get a Vanderbilt done just by the morning teacher. Find out it's the afternoon more of a struggle. Is it more, can you make all the harder classes in the morning because the kid does better in the mornings and not in the afternoon. So maybe a math and your English can be in the morning and your PE can be later in the day. That way, if the kid's good at focusing in the mornings and he gets that, um, you know, I often also say this more squeaky the wheel, the more grease it gets at schools. School districts are pretty tough. Eans does a good job. Um, they really take care of kinetic learning and all of these things. But Austin ISD is the hardest one sometimes to get people, get resources, but really going after and finding out what your kid's struggling and getting the 504 accommodations and then the IEP, all of that, what your kid needs, because you want to support them from 
all directions, what you're doing at home, how do you get make school a little more comfortable and then working through um, diet and meds. Mm -hmm. Awesome, is there any more questions? Do you see any more ask on your end? No, I don't see any ask or not. Okay. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Bilal. We really appreciate your time. It's a pretty uh, vast topic. You've covered it really well. Thank you. I love it. I love it.